Hello everyone, I'm here today with Bo Sachs. Bo is a veteran of the printing and publishing industry since 1970. He started his career with the founding of his own weekly newspaper in the metro New York area, and after several years in the alternative press, publishing newspapers in the New York and Tucson area, he went on to become one of the founding fathers of High Times Magazine. Bo's resume lists directorships at such prestigious companies as McCall's, Time Inc., New York Times Magazine Group, International Paper, Ziff Davis, CMP, and Bill Communication. Today, Bo's firm, Precision Media Group, does private consulting and publishes Heard on the Web Media Intelligence, a daily e-newsletter that delivers pertinent industry news to a publishing community of over 16,000 media industry leaders, and it's the longest running e-newsletter in the world. And today we are here to talk about ad blocking. It's here and only going to get worse. Now what should we do? Bo, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, David, and thanks for that uh, magnificent introduction. <laughs> Most of it is actually true. Well, good, good, good. I I, I, uh, I added some things. I don't know if you noticed, but um, no, I'm joking. <laughs> All of it's true, and uh, as you can see, uh, we're going to be talking about a topic that um, probably not more than a small handful of people are as qualified as Bo to speak on. So very excited to... Um, Hear what you have to say today, Bo. Um, it's going to be very interesting, and I know this is a it's been a hot topic, and it continues to be a hot topic because it's again, it's um, it's only going to get worse. So um, to just kind of dig into or it, or better, or better, yeah, uh, yeah. There you go, yeah, yeah. And I, I think everybody will know what you mean by that in a second. So uh, to quickly just uh, explain, why don't you just explain quickly what ad blocking is? Oh, we start with the simple, simple things yeah. first. Yeah. Um, ad blocking is nothing more than a technology, a relatively new technology, which allows, amazingly enough, the blocking of ads. <laughs> okay. The block happens in, in like nanoseconds, and um, it happens before the ads are loaded into your web browser. So what does that mean? That means you're saving valuable brand bandwidth and time, and the page... Okay of which your reading is rendered faster. Um, it happens faster because there are no bloated or unwanted ads. Mm -hmm. That gotcha. simply that is what ad blocking is. And that obviously came about because of user experience. People were probably complaining about it, and somebody saw an opportunity to to satisfy all these people, and that, that hence we have this ad blocking, but that's obviously created some dilemmas in the marketplace. So that kind of leads us to uh, our next question here. Now, why should this be a concern, and who should this be a concern for? Great question. Um, if you just think about how the industry ha has evolved over the last few years, you kind of have to question, like, what should we be worried about? Ad fraud, mm -hmm. ad blocking, identity theft, malware, keyboard capture, uh, and a dozen of other things. I could go on probably for an hour listing all the abuses that a common reader uh, has experienced. And this is a problem for anybody. It's a problem for businesses, and it's a problem for the general reader. And every solution that we come up with seems to be only temporary solutions, including ad blocking. Now, you say problem for a reader. What do you mean by that? Because isn't this, uh, isn't this something that, you know, people who are all about it or just jumping up and down enjoy that, that this exists? What, well, what problems are you talking about? It's my experience that in this world nothing is black and white. And some of the ad blockers, which profess to be protecting the public, are actually making a profit by allowing some ads through the system. So there's a bounty. These guys are like pirates, not all of them, but some of them. And if okay. you pay the company, the ad blocker, they will allow some ads to get through. So oh. it's a That's gray true. area. In fact, <laughs> it's not that gray to me, but so it's not a perfect system. Yeah, and obviously people who make their hay on um, ad dollars, online ads, um, obviously they're – those people are probably very, very concerned by this um, and, and are, the one, are probably the companies that we're mainly talking to today to see what, what they can do um, 
about it. Is that kind of how you see it too, or are there any other types of industries rather than media sites? But I, I'm assuming those are the main people who uh, this is a top concern for. Is there any any anybody else we might well, be forgetting about? concern for everybody. I, I, um, if I understood your question, it's not only for media people. Um, mm -hmm. All commerce is transacted on the web now. There isn't a, I, I can't think of a single industry that's not on the web. So it's not just media. Um, if, even if you're a plumber or a lawyer or, you know, cab drivers, everybody's operating on the web. And so they're exposed on the web. Businesses are exposed and the consumer is exposed. And there is no solution in sight yet, at least none that I see that it's uh, applicable and good for both sides because one should strive for a win-win. It's good for the businesses. It's good for the consumer. How do we achieve that goal? That is a good question. We're not there yet, not even close. Okay. Now, uh, just to kind of, you know, in, in preparing for this podcast, I kind of just did, did a little research and to put it in context for everybody, I believe that there's about 200 million people who are using ad blocking uh, software. And then on top of that, if I'm not mistaken, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that some of the new uh, operating systems um, from at least Macintosh, if I'm not mistaken, are going to have it written into um, – written into their into their code, I guess, or whatever, it's automatically going to default to having ad blocking written in. Is that is that still the case? Is that still on the table? Is that happening? Yes, but it's um, – this is just like a war. Um, you know, we started with bows and arrows, and that wasn't good enough, and we made guns, that wasn't good enough. We made uh, um, howitzers, and that wasn't good enough, and we made tanks. We keep elevating – the level of this ad war. And to your question, sure, sure. Apple's Apple building in uh, ad blocking. Ad blocking. Mm -hmm. And if you, uh, and if you listen to uh, the report yesterday from Facebook, uh -huh. they have built a program that is going to block the ad blockers. Yeah. So I thought now, you about that today, actually, yeah. We, we've elevated, you know, this level of war, you know. We haven't gone to the nuclear answer yet, but that's what's happening. So now that Facebook has developed uh, a blocker for ad blocking, well, the ad blockers will develop a block for the blocker. There is no end to this. It's all technology. Uh, yeah, it, it definitely seems like a merry-go-round here. So. I, I think we have identified that, yeah, th th this is a concern, this is an issue, this is a problem, you know, which side of the fence you're on, you know, w which, which one that you, you know, are you pro ad blocking, are you against ad blocking? Regardless, we, we know that this is a big deal and it's a current problem and it's only, or a current issue, I guess, uh, and it's only growing. Now, what what can marketers or publishers or whomever actually makes money from serving ads, what what can they do about it? That's the big question. If I had the answer, I'd be making a lot of money as a consultant. Um, but here, here's the thing. What's at the heart of this issue? The, the real bottom line um, is how does one recover trust once it's lost? I think it was, uh, it was Frederick Nietzsche. He said, I'm not upset that you lied to me. I'm upset that from now on I can't believe you. So that's at the core of the issue, lost trust. Uh -huh. Once it's gone, it's unrecoverable. It's an unrecoverable asset. And I'm afraid we'll never be able to regain the trust once we've lost it. So what can uh -huh. we do? Your question is, what can we do? Yeah. <laughs> the answer is to try to act honorable for an extended period of time. And here's the, the kicker, hope that the rest of the industry does too. And I ask you, what are the odds of that happening? Zero, I would say. There you go. So we're we're our marketing friends are in a tough bind. Um, I think the best thing that you can hope for, and social media could be good at this. Um, you got to go out there and present your image, your branded image, as one that is trustworthy. Mm -hmm. and, and if you can achieve that goal, then you can circumvent the mistrust that's out there, that you're not one of those. 
So you've got to have a program to prove that you are not a pirate on the web. Okay. So, I mean, what are – can you give any examples of – I mean, obviously, you know, people who are doing it right, you know, integrity with their publishing and their reporting and, you know, with the people coming to their site. But are, are there – is there anything else in any other creative examples of what somebody what other companies are doing to combat the issue of ad blocking? I believe I saw um, an example of um uh is it the uh New York Times is is doing some things. Um I believe the Financial Times are are doing some other things. Can can you talk about what 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 people are doing to combat this outside of, you know, trying to win the trust of their reader base? Um, not really. In that, you know, the New York Times has a built-in credibility factor, um, and and they're parlaying that. And and what the, the key is transparency. The only way to get through this is to be above board and transparent in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Um, the the public, who are you know on one level incredibly smart, incredibly powerful. Um, are less educated in our business. They don't really know what a sponsored ad is or what it means. They don't know what native advertising is or what it means. And when we gracefully, uh, happily put sponsored content on the top of uh, an ad, well, they don't get it. They don't know. And then mm -hmm. so, or, or an article, uh, well, but sponsored content is an ad in disguise. And that's my point. We are we are using deception to to uh, to head down the you know path of revenue. We all want revenue. Nothing wrong with it. Should be honorable, but it's not always honorable. We take shortcuts, um, and perhaps the longer road is the best road. You know, the, yeah. this is, Sorry, this may be tangential, you know, but I think this all comes about um, from greed. That's that's the problem. We seem to have gone from seeking an honorable profit in a capitalist system to unbounded greed, and and this is becoming recognized. The greed is infiltrated into everything, publishing and politics alike. You know, there's less civility and more crassness in everything, and it's all compounded on the web. I don't know of any cure for greed. What was that? I don't know of any cure for greed. <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe meditation, but yeah, um, yeah, mm -hmm. that, that 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 that's a tough one. Now you mentioned trust and everything, and I believe what the New York Times is doing is they're basically asking people to whitelist them from being ad blocked, and and that probably only will come if you're right. I mean, you got to start at at getting that trust from your reader base and then and then asking them a simple request and letting them know that that's how you're able to pay your reporters and and able to put out great content you know it's it comes with a cost and you know you make your money so you just explain to people with full transparency this is what's up you know please you know let us make our let us make some money so we can continue to serve you in in, in you know an honorable and, and integrity uh laden way is that kind of the way is what you were kind of Exactly, towards. and and I I think we we agree on um, in this format that the New York Times is an honorable corporation. And yet, mm -hmm. last week, or maybe it was early this week, it was reported that they inadvertently sent out ad malware in in their advertising, um, which was doing identity theft. So here's. Oh. The honorable and honest New York Times, who inadvertently sent out malware. This is pretty complicated. We're yes. getting into some deep and murky areas, and I still trust the New York Times, but they didn't do their due diligence on what they were sending out. Wow. One of our best examples here <laughs> is even making mistakes on it. So yeah, it's yeah, it's definitely you can see how how deep and um, how I guess how many different layer how many layers there are to all of this. Now, you mentioned native ads. Um, just give a 
I, I know they're not the newest thing in the world, so just give a, a quickly describe what these are, and then give your thoughts on the pros and cons of them, and then if possible, if you can give some examples of companies, you know, using these correctly. Okay, native advertising. It's a type of disguised advertising, um, usually, but not always online. This kind of the trick of native advertising it matches the form and function of the platform on which it resides. If it's in print, it'll look like a typical editorial page. If it's on the web, it will just look and match the corresponding uh, template for that site. So native advertising, if it's not done well and not done in moderation, in my opinion, it will go down in history books as yet another lost opportunity. A lost opportunity for revenue and another opportunity to lose trust. Like everything else in the world, you know, there can be too much of a good thing. With 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 the right context and done in the right way, I think it can be a win win for everybody. But I would take you back to my greed formula. Once we discover a path, a new path of revenue, we have a tendency to uh overextend ourselves, to put it politely. Yeah, so, but native ads is, it's basically a banner ad that is, it, it can be. Spot not a on. banner ad. No, I would, I would disagree. Or, it's not a banner okay. ad. Okay. Uh, native advertising uh, is embedded into the product to look like editorial. Okay. Native How is it to the, na native to the, the, the uh, land that it lives in. So, if you're on the New York Times, um, a native ad will look just like another article in the New York Times. Gotcha. If you're on Forbes, it is even more disguised as uh, just another article that you may or may not want to read. And, and when it's done incorrectly or deceptively, it looks like an article, but then it directs to not the article that was you thought you were clicking through, correct? Yeah. That, native, that, native advertising, unlike... Uh, sponsored advertising, native advertising um, is much more subtle. Sponsored clearly says on the top, this is a sponsored ad. I go back to what I said a few minutes ago, is saying something that is sponsored content. They don't say sponsored ad. They say sponsored content. Is that enough of a highlight to the general public to say, you're now being pitched by my client? What are your Probably thoughts on sponsored not. content? I, I mean, am what, what, for I mean, every like way. Like I am a for-profit guy. I am okay. for every way that we can honorably make a good living, shelter our family, you know, feed everybody. Um, but the operable word there is in an honorable way. And mm -hmm. sponsored content can be done right, can be transparent. Native advertising can be can be done right and classic. Like my favorite example I learned many, many years ago, because it's very old, David Ogilvy, um, who is known in some circles as the father of advertising, he created a series of ads, and it's, this was the Guinness Guide to Oysters. And it was all about oysters, but it was the Guinness Guide to Oysters. Well, how brilliant is that? Cleverly, out front, this is Guinness, but the but the really the article was about oysters. Beautiful pictures, a great read. Um, that's how to do it right. All right. Now, uh, then that would that that was sponsored content, or is that an, I guess native ads? They kind of that was a native together. native ad. Native but you know, ad. I would say that's a hybrid because you know, although it's a native ad, it still says right. You know, the headline was Guinness Guide to Oysters. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, that did. Yeah, they did. Exxon's, that's how it's a little you know, Exxon's guide to SUVs. You know, and if you had a really good article about SUVs, um, but it doesn't say sponsored. It says Exxon's guide. This one I'm making up, but as an example, Exxon's mm -hmm. guide to SUVs. I might read that article. Yeah. Now let's dig into that. Now you know. Obviously, the purpose of everybody, you know, listening to things like this and, and reading other, you know, is to really try to take some pointers home because I, I, I think we're 
we're really showing that you know this is just a dilemma and like how how can we how can we help people find some alternatives and find some good ways of doing it so we talked about a little bit about native ads and you gave some examples of, of how to do it correctly and basically it's make sure you know go ahead and be transparent and direct people to what you say you're directing them to now sponsored content is, is obviously um, you know an article that's right in your face that's brought to you by can can you just get, you know let's talk to marketers and publishers what what give them some pointers like what what should they do if they want to go this route how, how can they you know, the, you know, with the ad blocking, okay, we're not going to be doing banner ads. We're not going to be doing those. You know, we're going to go this other direction. Why don't Why don't we talk a little bit about some good pointers for doing this the correct way? And when I say correct, I mean not just making the reader happy, but being able to make your payroll and and make some money out of it. So, uh, you know, I want I want the right way to be um, both of those things. You know, so why why, why don't There's you take into that? There's a simple answer to this. There's a simple okay. answer to this. It's although the answer is simple, the achievement of the goal is not always that easy. And that is, um, and this is also classic. Uh, what are the needs of my um, client on either side, marketer or reader? What are my needs? If you can answer that question and and supply the answer to that, you got a winner. If you can only supply half their need, you're going to be less effective. If you're not supplying any of their needs, their true needs, then you have an ineffective campaign. So the analysis goes into, I have X and X product. How does that fit into the lifestyle of my client? How can I help him with his or her needs? So that's a pretty simple uh, statement. Now, how do you go about and make that happen. And that's why it doesn't always work. You got to do your research. You got to do your homework. You got to do your uh, uh, investigation. Supply the answer. What are the needs of the client? All right. So, let, can you do you have any examples? We can kind of put it in context of somebody possibly doing it the right way. And you don't need to give a, a real life example. You can kind of make one up in your head, I guess, or a real life <laughs> would be great too. But you know, to well, kind of put I would, it in I would context, go back to Guinness Guide to Oysters. You know, Guinness okay. wants to sell beer. Beer and oysters go really well. Um, okay. One assumes that that article will interest those who like oysters. So you're satisfying the need. How you know? How do you make oysters? How do you serve oysters? But that's with any product. How do you make it? How do you serve it? What do you want to do with it? How can I make it the best uh, experience possible? That's the end of the, the bottom line. How do I make this experience the best possible? And you know, if I was selling whiskey, it'd be both acts explanation to the perfect martini, better gotcha. than anybody else's. Gotcha. So basically, what we're saying is, if you are going to be going the route of sponsored content. Don't put a, you know, a Disney, you know, Disney sponsors, um, you know, the top 25 most fit bodies, you know. That wouldn't make any sense. But, uh, you know, you need to basically have it match up and make sense. You know, what you were saying yes, about it should relate to oysters, it should relate. Yes. Yeah. So that, okay. Yeah, and then that's where I think some people, and I and I think that's where, a lot of things went wrong in the, you know, in, in the past is, you know, that you're just so busy chasing the dollar, you're not really, you know, stopping and thinking like, well, does this make sense? And if you're going to have, you know, a piece of, a bang up amazing piece of content and you're sponsoring it by a sponsor that just makes, you can't make any, draw any correlation to it, you're not doing the reader any good because they're going to be seeing this ad or this company that, you know, it might not apply to them because their interests are lie elsewhere. And on the flip side of that, you're not doing the the brand any any favors either because now you're putting them in front of people who aren't their most likely are not their target market. So basically, just use your head, right? I mean, just make sure it yeah. makes sense for I, everybody. I, I'm a big believer of common sense. Unfortunately, common sense is not all that common. <laughs> all right. Now. Um, 
some of these other like more technical types of ways to combat ad blocking and stuff. And of course, these would be for you know really large media type of companies. But just wanted to touch on them a little bit and, and get your thoughts. And I think I know what you're going to say, but I still would like to bring it out there. It's like these like page fair and, and secret media. I would like to think I would like to think you would never know what I'm going to say. Well. I don't yes, page fair, know, secret gonna, media. Yeah. yeah, well, you're going to guess right. Um, <laughs> so you're asking me about a service that delivers advertising in a manner that ad blockers are unable to block. So you're back <laughs> to what the Facebook is doing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so that's deceptive, is it not? So you just yep. brought me back to trust. Yep. The consumer has an ad blocking program, and now we have a service that's going to circumvent that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think Ernest, Ernest Hemingway covered that one pretty well. He said the best way to find out if you can trust somebody is to trust them. <laughs> <laughs> and here's a case where we have now abused the trust. It's stupid. It's it, it, you know, these are flashes in the pan, and and they they might make a few bucks, you know, in the short term, but long term it's a losing proposition because at the end of the day, the consumer is smart and will be protective of himself in any way he can. And if a publisher abuses that privilege, they're not going back. If a marketer, you know, uh, abuses the privilege, uh, they will lose sales, not gain sales, long term. Mm -hmm. Don't choose so, yeah, the customer. Yeah, yeah. so uh, you know we're sitting here, and I, I know you know there's people out there who don't mind you know no. putting elbow grease and doing things the right way. There's other people out there who are always looking for you know possibly a shortcut or a tool to fix everything or a magic wand. They just get to wave, and all all these issues go away. But you know everyone out there, you're, you're listening to you know literally one of the most you know. Premier publishing online and print, digital, the whole works. Experts in the world, and you are too kind. Well, it's fairly accurate, but I, you know, I, I don't mind saying it. You know, as long as it's true, <laughs> right? As long as it's true, and it is true. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you have this guy telling you all, listen, there's no shortcut. There's no easy answer. Easy answer. Do it the right way. Win the trust. Then you can even go so far as ask people to, you know, ask them for, you know, a small favor of let let them show you ads or, or sponsor content the correct way. You can make money that way. But all of this comes down to only if you're doing it the right way, We're building that trust, delivering on what you say you will. If you are going to be, you know, advertising and making money, make sure it makes sense. You know, don't waste anybody's time or anybody's money or anybody's efforts. Just just uh, you know, I, and, um, and anybody out there who was looking to get a, a quick fix, quick answer, uh, you're not going to get it here, I guess, today. And um, and I, you need to go back to the drawing board if you're having issues with this, and, and start start just, I guess, being better. You know, and is that you know, and I, I guess am, am I missing I, the mark on on this, or is that basically I you know, couldn't have said it better myself. I All couldn't right. have said it better myself. All right. Well, but I, I would now. add, you know, at the, at the same time as we're offering all this um, sound advice um, that shouldn't stop anybody from performing and trying and doing the best they can. Because on the other side of what we've all just said, this is my day for quotations, P.T. Barnum has a great quote, without promotion, something terrible happens. Nothing. Uh -huh. So you got to be out there. You got to play the game. So mm -hmm. just do it right. Do your homework. Yep. Do it right. Be honest. Yep. Yeah, I mean, you have native advertising. You have sponsored content. You still really do have online ads, really. Um, you know, I mean, even though it's growing and it's a problem, it's still a viable, you know, solution to for advertising dollars. So you do. Have I have ads in my newsletter. I have ads in my newsletter. They are yeah. right out in front. They're not intrusive. They're not hidden. There's nothing secret about it. And my people get positive branding. My my newsletter has a fairly um, respected position 
in my advertisers right along with that respect. That's how it should work. My guess is they're we, applicable too to your reader base. If I'm oh, just absolutely. A, a guess right there, right? So, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're yeah, exactly. So, yeah, you have these alternatives. Just do it the right way. So, you know, make sure everything makes sense. Make sure it's applicable. Now, moving on to another way. You know, may, this is probably mainly again for bigger media companies. But what what are your thoughts on having readers and consumers pay for content? You know, do you? I don't want just your opinion on like you know in theory, although you can speak in theory uh, on part of this answer. But I also want to know what's actually happening out there when people have tried to do this. Has it worked? Does it work? Well, the answer is absolutely yes, and I think that that is the holy grail that answers all of the questions we brought up today. Um, and this is more for publishers. Um, but the consumer can, is willing to pay for content that's worth paying for. The Economist is a great example. There's hardly a magazine out there uh, uh, that has a higher subscription rate or per copy cost. And they're doing extremely well on the web, in print, because they have extremely high quality content that their consumers are willing to pay for. They don't give anything away for five bucks, as some magazines do, who are seeking out rate base. And rate base is a conversation for another day. Um, but no, they've decided to charge their clients what they deem the content is worth. And that formula is actually working. Can everybody do that? Depending upon your sphere of influence, almost yes. If you're in the news business, the answer is harder. If, but if you're like, they have financial information, it's quality information. There are sports sites where people are paying for sports information. Uh, there are niches, any niche that you can develop, you can charge for good quality content. It's being done. It will be done. And that's the answer to many of our problems. Fair value, fair cost. Mm -hmm. Now, are there any differences in strategy for large-scale publishers, you know, the BuzzFeeds of the world and even the New York Times of the world versus smaller niche local publishers or online sites? Are there I'm, any, any I'm differences? Sure. I'm, I'm just curious, is there any, any difference? I mean, it sounds like obviously paying for content, um, I guess not. You know, I guess I'm kind of, you know, answering my own question here. I mean, all uh, – No, but, but let's take this tangentially for a second because you mentioned okay. BuzzFeed. Um, again, back to Facebook, and they won't be the only one doing this. They now have an algorithm to prevent clickbait, which is what BuzzFeed is all about. Um, and, and, and that's, again, back to trust because how many times are you going to click on – on these uh, fake articles and, and be disappointed because that's what clickbait is all about. They give you this spotty, great headline like, oh, my God, going to learn something, see something, do something, and it's just a come on. It's nothing. Um, so BuzzFeed is going to start to struggle now that there are formulas for eliminating clickbait, something to think about. So basically the – the only thing, really, the, not necessarily a difference, is if you are big and you are doing these things, your problems are just going to be, you know, exponentially larger for yourself. So basically, if you are a big publisher and you aren't doing it the right way, or you're a big online site, uh, you're gonna, you really need to start paying attention here fast because you're gonna get, you're gonna get dinged. You're gonna more than a ding. You're gonna get smashed, and your business the, the, uh, is gonna be going away. The advantage. The advantage that larger publishers have, and they do have one, is their large war chests. And David Carey from Hearst has a great expression. He says he doesn't mind failing so long as they fail fast. Smaller mm -hmm. corporations can't absorb that, but but Carey can. Um, and that's how they operate. They, they don't mind experimenting and trying new things. Uh, and if it doesn't work out, well, we'll just fail fast and move on to something else. Your, your smaller, mid-sized publisher doesn't have that war chest um, and uh, is more re resistant to taking those kinds of uh, explorations and creativity. Mm -hmm. but, but, again, it all circles back to 
just start doing, you know, build your reader base the right way, build your trust the right way, then you'll have all the opportunities of monetization at your at your fingertips. And, and then quality you know counts. Right, and there you go. Quality counts not only in in the content you provide, but in the readership, the quality of your readership is just as lucrative as the positive content. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I didn't really, you know, when we, when we uh, you know, went to, decided to talk on this topic and, you know, I did, you know, really dug into everything and, and looked at all the, you know, did a lot of research and saw all these, you know, tricks and this and that or blah, blah, blah. I really wasn't quite sure where, where today was going to go. Um, I, I guessed um, it was going to go this direction, but I didn't know for certain. So I, I really appreciate you, you know, really putting a nail in the coffin of, listen, there's no shortcuts. Um, in, the, in the long run, there's really no shortcuts. And uh, anybody out there who is looking to find, uh, you know, the shiny new object to, to take care of this issue, you're not going to find it. You're not going to find it from Bo, at least. And you're not going to most likely find it out there. And, and it really circles back around to quality content, transparency, um, you know, good old-fashioned doing things the right way. Um, and and I, I appreciate you uh, uh, really, really bringing to light that, you know, driving that home today. Uh, do, do you have any other parting thoughts before uh, we uh, end no, this I, I awesome think call? You summed it up well, but I, I guess I would add in, in your um, roundup of – you know, that quality counts that these are not just buzzwords. We, we really mean it. Quality does count, and that's the clearest, safest way to success. Mm -hmm. Don't just mm -hmm. say it, believe it. Mm -hmm. Pay for those writers, right? All those writers <laughs> out there who are listening, we'll give you a shout out. And, and you know, that's one industry that I've seen, uh, one line of work. Uh, I guess I think I've been saying this for a couple years, but not not more than a couple, but about a couple uh, years that you know uh, that that that's a newfound uh, uh, job to go you know into journalism, uh, and you know for a while there was when it was all about I guess four or five six years ago before all these updates from Google hit were were just you know links and just getting stuff written and getting it up there and da da da, and I as you know most. Most most marketers know that that's really changed, and Google's really you know put put a clamp down, and and they've it circled back around to quality and uh, yeah. you know paying writers what they're worth. Uh, so you know I, I I've seen that that's a new profession for people, and good 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 you know you know it's not just a bunch of crap being written out there. We need good crap written out there, <laughs> you know, good stuff. So uh, yeah, so the quality quality quality. Well, awesome, Bo. Hey, I appreciate it. Always, always Thank you. fun to talk with you. Um, I, this I is think fun. You, Let's do it again. Uh, we'll do it again. We'll do it again soon, and and hopefully we we won't talk about such a um, uh, uh, kind of a nastier topic. But maybe we will. Maybe those are more fun. So, anyways, hey, I appreciate you, and uh, until next time. All right. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. All right. Bye bye. Bye. And if you'd like to continue to learn from Bo Sachs, you can sign up for his free media industry newsletter, which also happens to be the world's o oldest. And you just need to go to www.bosacks.com. That's www.bosacks.com. And also you can follow him on Twitter at, at Bo Sachs. Thank you very much.